Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Modern Workplace with Microsoft 365 webinar with Sergio Busti. Um, my name is Debbie Perry. I'll be the moderator today. So if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to pop them into the uh, chat area in your control panel. So sit back and relax, and I'll now hand you over to Sergio. Thanks, Debbie. OK, good morning, everybody. Um, Welcome to the Modern Workplace with Microsoft 365 presentation. My name is Sergio Justi. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to myself. I have around 15 to 20 years experience in the IT industry. Started off as most of us do, starting as a general IT, IT analyst, etc. Working then, uh, I moved on into the Microsoft SharePoint arena. Um, around SharePoint 2007 well, it was my first version of SharePoint. I then progressed through to SharePoint 2010, 2013, started 2016, but that's really when Office 365 sort of started to grow. And so uh, I moved into that space with SharePoint Online and then the associating apps that come with that. So that's just a little bit of an introduction to me. Um, I'll turn this webcam off now and we will begin. Okay, so in today's presentation, we're going to be discussing what is a modern workplace. Um, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of Microsoft 365, and then we'll have a discussion around what modern workplace is with Microsoft 365, how those applications align to form the, the concept of this modern workplace. We'll then have a look at some of the security tools available also within Microsoft 365. We'll then have a, a, a Teams demo where I'll be going over some of the, the core concepts of Teams, but also trying to expand out into some of the, the, the things that often get missed within Teams. Um, we'll then possibly have a look at uh, a Power Platform demo, uh, an application. That, that can be quickly put into place using some of the tools within Modern Workplace. And then we'll have a look at some governance and best practice considerations. Okay, let's start. So the world has changed. Um, this is very true at the moment. Uh, generally speaking, the world has changed from where it was in terms of employees are working from home more, often dispersed, um, sometimes or often using mobile devices. There's also three or four different generations of people in the workforce, which can present a challenge to business. You have the, the older generation who are used to doing things the old way, and you have the younger generation who have grown up really with having everything on an app. They, they're used to using their mobile devices, phones, tablets, and they expect an app to be able to do the majority of the tasks that they are they required to do. Um, security also from an outside perspective has never been so great as it is right now. And and also the world is a, a, a giant network now. Data is connected and easier to obtain. Data that you have that you think is yours is not necessarily always secure. And that information is moving between devices and systems, often without you knowing it. So, what is a modern workplace? Well, the best place to, the best way to sort of describe that is to start look thinking about what was the classic workspace. So, the the classic workspace was businesses having their own premises, all of their staff working in those premises, typically nine to five, all of their software that they're running. To, to run their business sitting on servers inside of their own business, and those are sitting on their premises. The modern workplace, however, is not the same. If we fast forward to now, we have more users are tech savvy um, using digital. Life has become much more fast paced, much more mobile, and um, people tend to work across different devices. And there's definitely a work life blur in terms of getting home from work and still being at work or starting work in the morning before you even head into an office or to see a customer. 
So let's take a look at what Microsoft 365 is. So Microsoft 365 is really split into two, two areas, um, taking aside security. And um, there's a communication and collaboration side, and then there's also a productivity and automation side. But on the communication and collaboration side, there's a whole host of different applications, Microsoft Outlook, Microsoft SharePoint, Yammer, the Office applications, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, et cetera, and Microsoft Teams. And these tools are all designed um, to be the to enable your users to communicate and collaborate more effectively. Now, the backbone of all of Office 365 is the SharePoint application. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we come to the Teams demo. Um, backing up the Office 365 piece is something called an Office 365 group. So whenever you create um, an Outlook group or a SharePoint group or a team or, or various other applications, Microsoft Planner, um, you get a Office 365 group created in the background. And this thing controls your membership. So who are your owners, who are your, your members? And, and that then works across all the different apps and services within Office 365 to give you that security and give you a central place for your compliance in relation to that. Um, as I mentioned, the other side to that is the, the productivity and automation side. So there's the Power Platform, which is Power Apps, Power Automate, Power BI, and now Power Virtual Agents. There's also in built into that a thing called AI Builder, which is sort of a, a junior version of, of a lot of the cognitive services functions from Microsoft Azure. And there's also then um, something called Connectors, which is uh, essentially integration between systems so you can connect one system to another system fairly easily and seamlessly using the the power platform in addition to some of these apps i would also say that um, sharepoint teams and planner also fall into the productivity side uh, you can use those apps to to automate and build brand new business processes and again, that's all backed up by Office 365 groups, security, and then sitting at the background of all of that is something called the Microsoft Graph. So this is um, an AI from Microsoft that sits at the back of Office 365, and it essentially sits and watches what everybody is doing in Office 365, and then it tries to give you assistance while you're working. So as an example, let's say you're working on a, a document and that document is saved in SharePoint, and that document that, that's in a, a SharePoint site linked to a customer account, which is linked to something in Dynamics. When you start working on uh, a, another document for another customer in a similar situation, if that customer has be, had documents created from other users around your organization that you have never seen, you've had no visibility of, you don't know exists, the Office Graph will offer those documents to you as content that may be related to what you're doing based on the relationship of you working with the same customer that those documents are, are tagged against. We can have a look more at that later. Okay, so Modern Workplace with Microsoft 365. I thought the best way to, to start with this would be to simply offer you a scenario. So I, I can't give you the real business name. I, I've just changed them to say Contoso. Um, but in this scenario, we're going to look at um, this company called Contoso. So this is a, a real customer of mine. Um, they're a multi-utility connections company. So what that means is they're essentially going out and um, laying, when a new estate is getting built across the UK, um, the send out engineers to lay gas lines, water lines, electric lines. Um, so they are heavily regulated and um, they approached me with a, a, a problem that they were facing in terms of how they were running their, their um, business essentially in terms of how they were running the, the management of the tasks given out to their engineers. So the problem they faced was that each engineer across the UK, and there, there were hundreds of them, would start work on a Monday, they'd go into their local office, they'd get given a set of tasks for whichever um, estates they were working on that week, 
told what jobs they were going to be doing and they'd be giving a big paper pack of each um, of all of the documents that they needed to fill out and sign and complete as they went through their work. They'd then spend the week doing that work and then on a Friday they'd take that paper pack back to the office, hand it in to um, the, the receptionist there and the office staff would then go through those documents the next week, check if there was any problems because of the, the compliance issues that they might have. Once everything was confirmed, they'd then enter that information into uh, another system. If there was a problem, they could immediately raise it with the engineer who was local, who would then be able to go back and resolve whatever problems there were. So they decided um, based on, on various factors that they needed to close. Um, they had about 75 different local offices around the UK. They decided to close those and centralize to streamline. So they created three central hubs across the UK. Um, this generated issues that they hadn't considered. So they were aware of the processes that their, their engineers were going through, but they were not aware of the volume of paperwork that was coming in or the volume of mistakes that were happening and how the office staff were dealing with those. So what happened when they centralized is they suddenly found they had engineers who were no longer had a local base. So they were having to um, get mailed out their paper packs for their work. Sometimes the mail would go missing. Sometimes the engineer um, would claim they didn't get it and the, and the company was unaware if that, that was true or not. Once they got the paper pack and they went out to do their work, they filled it in but they might not return it to the central hub for weeks or months based on sometimes what the guys were doing because the, these packs were sort of 50, 60 pages long for each one. So this was not a small amount of mail that was being sent out. And what they do because it was so, so much mail, whereas before they would get in their van, they would drive up to the local office and hand it in. Now what they were doing is they were just saving it up until they had a sufficient size and then they'd arrange a courier to come and get it and send it off to their the central hub. This caused several issues. One, the paperwork was going back into the office late, which meant when it got checked, if there was any problems, it was quite often causing an issue in terms of how to go and fix that. Because um, if you consider the, the scenario where I'm, I've gone into a housing estate, I've laid a load of electrical lines, that's done it's now say three months later, the office have finally received my paperwork back. They've found out that there's a problem. They want me to go and fix that. Unfortunately, the builders have now built houses on top of <laughs> the, the way I've laid my line. So I, can know, I can't just turn up and dig up that ground anymore. So that could cause a lot of issues. There's also regulatory issues around that. So as well as the regulatory issues, which were, which were heavy, um, there was also uh, an introduced to this scenario, a brand new uh, cost of all of the, the mail that was going back and forth. And also due to the volume of um, the paperwork that was coming in, the, the business had under anticipated the amount of staff they would need at the central hubs in terms of managing that paper load coming through. So that was the scenario that they came to to me with and said, you know, how can we how can we solve this problem? What can we do to use the modern workplace to to resolve the issues we've got, speed up this process? How can we digitize this in some way? So we started off uh, by building them a SharePoint site for their users. So this isn't the actual one, by the way, I, this is a, a demo that I've just put together for this presentation, but it's a simple SharePoint site. It'll let them pass out news between the office staff, between the three hubs. It also put a central place for all of the paperwork for all jobs that were going out to the engineers. So what we did was um, we built this SharePoint site and then for every job that was coming through, the company would, would have arranged this ahead of time. So the office staff knew before the work was getting passed out to engineers when the jobs were coming in a couple of months in advance. So they would come into this SharePoint site and they would create a new planner board for management of all the tasks in relation to that job. And then they would assign all of the tasks to the relevant engineers in each of the planners. And then they would attach the documents required 
into the job paperwork document library inside of SharePoint for the engineers to use. The idea was the engineers would then use their mobile phones and they would be able to then access the paperwork on their phones or their tablets, complete that, that those documents which would immediately be saved straight back into SharePoint which could notify the office admin staff instantly. So they could check the paperwork while it was being completed and point out any issues or any errors that were that were happening, which immediately resolved the delay issue. To enhance this, however, we what we decided to do was after we, we did some tests to make sure the users could use the system. And then um, when I say that, what I, I don't mean the office staff, it was more the, the engineers out on the road. So these are these are people who are digging up roads and laying electrical pipes they had not it, under any previous guise for this for their role used a, a tablet or a phone to do any of their work everything was done with paper and we were now switching them over digitally so we did some tests to make sure that could all work properly once we did then we streamlined this process by automating the creation of the microsoft planner so we introduced a microsoft team for the admin staff to communicate with each other to let other people in the office know jobs were, were in and needed to be assigned and then they could create the planner board. But what we did further then was we used a, a, a Microsoft Power Automate. So once the planner board was created, we created a list called jobs for the office staff. They would simply enter the ID number then of the planner board and a Microsoft Power Automate would then go away and create all of the tasks for all of the relevant engineers in that planner board. Furthermore, it would go and grab all of the documents from a template library and it would populate those documents directly into the jobs folder which for the engineer and then it would security trim those documents so that they were only available to the right people. The engineers themselves then simply used their mobile devices for the whole process now. So they would open up Microsoft Planner on their phones or tablets and be able to see a list of all tasks due for them on that day. They would also then have a link in that planner to open the SharePoint site, which would take them to find their paperwork so that they could download their documents and then they would use the Office applications on their device to complete that paperwork. And as I mentioned, that then sent an automatic notification to the office staff when those documents were completed so that they could be quality checked and the engineer could be contacted via Teams or over the mobile as required if there were any issues. Following on from that then, we had some thoughts for phase two. Uh, I haven't got a, a demo for this, but I'll just talk you through it. So based on the, on the other applications I showed you in Microsoft 365, the second phase of this, was to deliver a Power App solution. So rather than giving them Word documents and Excel documents, etc., to complete on their devices, what we uh, what we delivered was a Power App solution so that they could open up Power Apps on their mobile device and all of the forms for each job were simply all in one location and could be completed in real time. Okay, so I hope from that scenario and some of those screenshots, you can you can see that Microsoft 365 and the modern workplace, when they work together, can help to unlock creativity within staff and within your so within your system designers, your processes can become a lot more agile, a lot more efficient. You can work naturally with different devices, your phones, your tablets, um, laptops, etc. The whole thing is really built for teamwork. Now it's all backed up by, by a very good security system, but the whole thing is really built for groups of small or large groups to work together, to connect and to, to collaborate and to essentially improve their productivity on whatever, whatever it is they're doing. As I mentioned, it's integrated. So those connectors that you can work with will allow, uh, and ho hopefully that came across in, in, in some of those slides there, but it, in that Power Automate, which I showed you, we were you we were connecting SharePoint to Planner and to Teams, all from one location. And, and it was done in a matter of minutes.
And then backing it up is uh, some security tools. Now I'll not linger long on this one because I do have a, a better slide to show you for that. So EMS it's called, Enterprise Mobility and Security. So this backs up Office 365. So it's part of the Microsoft 365 suite. Uh, it is an additional license, or, or you can you can get it if you've got an E5 license. I'll talk through some of the applications that we're seeing in this slide uh, and some of the ones that aren't in this slide. Um, so there's information protection. So this helps you to protect your sensitive data everywhere, even in motion and when shared. So you can gain visibility and control over how any file is being used with a comprehensive and integrated information protection solution. So what that means is you can protect your data, but you can also control where it goes. And when it goes, you can control what happens when it gets there. So an example of that could be, um, I've just created one of those documents in that scenario, and I'm about to email it off to a supplier or um, to a regulatory body for, for a compliance issue. I can control when that document leaves and arrives with them if they're able to download it. Can they print it? Can they save it? How long will the attachment in the email live for? Things like that. Um, there is Microsoft Advanced Threat Protection. So this is a way to detect and investigate threats coming in to Microsoft 365. So you can set up things like smart links and smart attachments against your emails and against documents. You can also set up anti-phishing and malware. And there's a lot in Microsoft Advanced Threat Protection. There's also Advanced Analytics, which helps you work smarter with personal organizational information, gives you productivity insights, and helps you get better information to make better decisions. You've then got Advanced Compliance. You can access your compliance risk. So you can, you can literally go in and see how compliant are you and it will give you a score. And um, there's also something called a secure score, which does a similar thing in terms of how secure you are. You can use Microsoft Intune for device and app management. Uh, so you can help them be, be productive wherever they are. And you can do identity and access management, um, which also allows you to do um, access control policies. So you can set up things like, um, I'm in the UK, I've just accessed my device. If 10 minutes later, somebody tries to log in from my device in Germany, then you can set it up so that it will be, you can say, actually, if that happens, then obviously I didn't just move from the UK to Germany in 10 minutes, so don't let that person in or ask them for, give them a request a two-factor authentication code or something like that. You could also say um, blacklist certain countries, or you could say for, for all of my users or for all of these users, only allow people in if they're coming in from this location or they're on that domain or they're using one of these devices. Then in addition to all of that, outside of the EMS, just inbuilt into Office 365, you've got a whole host of other security features. So there's a security and compliance center, which will allow you to set up things like retention policies, sensitivity labels, sensitive information types. There's e-discovery and advanced discovery, um, plus many other things. So a little bit of an overview of some of those. Um, a retention policy is where you can define a, a label that you can then apply to content across Office 365 in any application. So it might be in an email, it might be in a document in OneDrive, it could be in a, a, a Teams conversation or a document sitting inside of SharePoint. And if whatever criteria you set up against your label is met, so it might be um, the a document contains a certain word or it contains a sensitivity, a sensitive information type, then once that's found and classified and the label is then applied to that content, that label will apply a retention policy. And that retention policy can be <clears throat> days, weeks, months or years. And you can set up what happens at the end. So it could be just delete it, it could be archive it, it could be send it for a disposition review, which is kind of like a, a, an approvals where you specify who it would go to or a group it would go to, and then you send it off to that personal group to say, you decide what to do with this content now that 
the retention is over. Sensitivity labels are a similar thing, but they can apply to, to do certain tasks, to block certain tasks. So <clears throat> an example would be, we have a, an email that we're going to send out and that email contains a national insurance number. And due to GDPR, we shouldn't be sending out people's national insurance numbers. So I could set up a, sensitive, a sensitivity label that says if somebody's using a sensitive information type of national insurance number, when that's found, don't allow that content to leave my organization. Or you can allow it to leave, but I'll present a warning first to the user to advise them, do you know you're about to send something out with sensitive information? Do you wish to proceed, yes or no? Um, there's also e-discovery and advanced e-discovery for, for putting holes on content. So you can go and search for content as a group across the Office 365 estate based on certain criteria. And when you find that criteria, you can, you can lock those records. This could be emails or documents. And what you're doing is you're saying these can't be deleted and they've been held for a specific reason. And then you can find them all in one place. It doesn't matter where they're actually located. You create a case in your in your e-discovery center. Um, there's also, in terms of GDPR, there's um, the option to uh, give you the right to be forgotten and also to do a search. So when you do get the request for information, so show me everything you hold about me, you can do that within the security and compliance center using the GDPR center. Okay, onto the Microsoft Teams demo. Okay, so in Microsoft Teams, um, I'm not going to go over all of the features thoroughly, but I am going to talk to you a little bit about Teams, what a team is versus a channel. I am going to talk to you about the chat area. I'm going to talk to you about the activity area. And then I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about some of the extra features that people tend to miss, um, such as adding additional tabs into a team channel or adding apps into their team or using the files area um, as it's supposed to be used. And also kind of a key one, which is the search bar right at the top, which is extremely useful. So Microsoft Teams, when you open it, um, you'll, you'll have various icons on the left-hand side. You may or may not have all of the same icons as what you're seeing here. This is due to um, how your Teams environment would have been configured by your administrators. Now, the Teams environment itself, when you open it, you'll generally always have activity, chat, Teams, and calendar. They may not be in that order, but they should be there. When you're inside of Microsoft Teams, you can create this concept of a team. Now, a team is simply a working space for a group of people to communicate and collaborate on. Now, why would you create a team versus a SharePoint site? Or why would you create a SharePoint site versus a team? Or why would you create something else versus a team? The reason for, the, for a team is it should be a group of people who wish to communicate and collaborate about something. And that should be the same people for the same something. The something you talk about then becomes your channels. So these are really your topical areas within the whole functional area that the team is for. So in this instance, I have a, I have a team here for the, the UK Modern Workplace Practice. So all members of the Modern Workplace Practice can see this team which means they can see all of these channels. And these are the topics that this team would then discuss or need to communicate or collaborate on. Um, you can see information which is in bold, which means there's information in there that I haven't read yet. And there's also when you, if you've got something where somebody's mentioned you specifically or mentioned the channel or mentioned the team, which I'll, I'll show you how to do shortly, um, you get these little red symbols showing up so that you know there's something in there that requires your attention. When you're inside of a, a team, yeah, you've got this concept of channels, as I've mentioned, which is sort of the discussion areas. This is where you can you can come in and you can have, have a chat, ask questions, etc. So basically, this is where you communicate with, your, with each other within this team area. Now, what you can do is you can mention specific people who are in this team. 
And if you do that, that person will get a notification that you have mentioned something or asked them a question. But you could also simply mention the channel. So if you do that, the at channel, you will mention the entire Power Apps channel, which means anybody who can see this channel, which is everybody in the team, will get a notification. But you could also mention the team. So you could say, actually, I want to mention the entire team and that will send it to everybody. Why would you choose, what's the difference between team and channel? As, as they seem to do the same thing in, the, in this example. In this example, they do the exact same thing. However, within channels inside of a team, um, I don't know if you notice this one has a little padlock. You can um, create when you are adding new channels, private channels, which are then only available to a subset of the members of that team. So why would you mention channel or team? If you were in here, you'd want to do a channel so that you don't tell everybody in the team that there's a notification for them because they won't be able to see this area. When you're in your, your channels, as well as your communications, you can also have a files area for sharing files. So these can be things that you're sharing with other people in this team around this topic, this channel. Um, now these documents are actually sitting inside of a SharePoint site. So ev everything pretty much in Office 365, most of the core applications, whenever you create one, you always get a SharePoint site. And that, that's a key consideration really. And we'll, we'll talk about that later when we come to the governance section, but that's something to, to consider when you are making your teams or making your SharePoint sites or making your planners or making your Outlook groups, etc., cetera, um, that you're always going to get a SharePoint site and how you then architect and build your build out your, your system should be considered. So in this area, I can add new documents or I can simply upload documents from my local computer. Um, you've also got, dependent on the channels you're in, additional options um, now so these could be added so i in, in this example i've added um a blog because it's the the power apps channel here i've added a link directly to the the power apps blog um from microsoft and similar i think i've done the same thing in the, in the power automate channel so that's an additional way of adding core functionality into my microsoft team that is useful for my users. So if they want to um, talk to me or ask a question inside of this channel, they can do so here. If they then need to go and read the Power Apps blog to get some useful information or some new information, they don't have to leave the Teams environment to do so. And this is really, this is the connectors part of Office 365. This is the, the integration. So we can come in here and we can add in connections to different applications that can then be used within our Teams environment. Now there's many more than what we're seeing here, but this Teams environment has been has got some governance in place and so, and so a lot of the connectors have been removed because we're using Teams. And that's again something I'll talk about in the governance section so that you get an insight into how that works. If I wanted for in this in this instance to add um, something linked to the SharePoint site, so I mentioned that this, this files area was stored in SharePoint. I can, I can actually open this by pressing open in SharePoint and it will just open that document library location straight in the document library, straight in the SharePoint site. But there might be something else in this SharePoint site so there's a few lists here. Um, there's some subsites with something else in, and there may be news and other things on the home page, etc., that you wish to link to. What you could do directly from in Teams is you can connect directly to SharePoint and show that additional information. So it will automatically pick up any pages 
So there's my news board, for instance, or I could show any lists directly within this team site. I can also, which is very useful, show any other web-based portal by using the website option. So all I'm required to do here is give this a name and enter a URL. So um, we will assume Nope, that's not valid. All right, there it is. So here's a way for me to put a website. Now, uh, let's assume I've got some sort of other web, other web portal. Maybe it could be my internet portal, my extranet portal. It could be a supplier portal from something else. It could be some other software, a, a dynamic system, um, dynamics finance and operations or dynamics CE. I could have that information in here directly in my channel. It could even be a, a deep linked URL, which means I could be linking specifically to something that's in relation to this channel rather than just going to say the Dynamics CE homepage. So that's a way of using extra connectors within Teams just to make your site a little bit more user friendly. So um, an example could be, so here we've got Microsoft Stream. This is a good way for creating training content. Create your training videos, pop them into Stream, and then you put that as a, a tab in your team so that when people arrive here, say for instance, I had some training videos for Power Apps, I could have those training videos directly shown here. So people don't need to go, oh, where are the, where's the training content for Power Apps? They, they don't need to think about that. When they land in this channel, the training content is there along with my communication between the team, any files in relation to this subject, and anything else I've wished to share. Okay, the chat area um, is very simple to um, the Teams that chat portion. So we're in Teams, we have the ability to, <clears throat> to have a conversation between the members of that team. A chat is essentially similar to that, but what you do is you create either a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many chat. When you create your chat, the entire history of everything you've ever said to that person is recorded, and you can play that back whenever you want. It's also searchable, which we'll come to shortly, but that's a really good consideration in terms of all of the different chats you're having with all of the different peoples within your organization are stored forevermore within Microsoft Teams. So if you think about that for a moment, a, a traditional way of communication between people within a business is to typically send an email to each other. Um, but if you can imagine I sent an email to everybody on this webinar, uh, I'd send it off to a whole group of people. Some of you might reply to all, some of you might reply to me individually. I might then have to reply to you individually or reply to everybody as well. All of a sudden, we've got multiple streams of a conversation happening. I've got visibility of several different email chains happening. Some of you might have where a few where people have replied to all. Some of you will have more where people are having individual. In a year's time, Let's say we've we've had a discussion about something, and it's in a year a year later, and we we remember we've got a similar issue, and we need to find that information. If it was me, fine, I, I've got it. I've got a track of all of those emails. I could go into Outlook and I could search and and try and find that information. But if it was anybody else, there's potential for them to have missed pieces of that information. Also, let's say somebody new joined the business, and we wanted to share that information with them they can't get that information because they, it was never in their outlook. No, they were never included in the email. If you're having a multiple group chat or you're having a conversation in a team, all you need to do is add this new person into this group. And inside of Teams, anybody who was in the team, even if they weren't part of, let's say, the, in this, this scenario, the email chain, needs to find that information. All they ever need to do is use search. Now the search uses natural language processing, so you don't need to be exact with your search, you just need to be close. 
Um, the chat also has a files area for you to share files between each other. And what's very useful, um, let me find someone who I might have had this with. No, I don't I think I have. But in the activity area, you'll see it brings up um, a list of diff every chat you've had. But what it's telling me is where that chat took place. So I can see which team it was in and which channel it was in, in that team. Why that's useful is I might know that I had a conversation with this person at some point about something. That might have been in any channel, in any team that I'm a part of. And I might not remember where I had that chat with that person. So what I can do using the chat functionality here is if I go to the activity tab against that person, and if I don't have a personal chat with them, I can simply start a new one. Um, so let me pick somebody I've never spoken to, but that I might have had a... I'll just pick this, this guy as an example. So once I've started a chat, I've got this activity tab. Now there'll be nothing in there for this guy because I've never spoken to him before. <laughs> um, but if, if we think about this scenario where I've got James here and I've got my activity, this is showing me all the conversations that I've ever been involved in with this person. Not necessarily they were speaking to me, but it's just a conversation that I've got visibility of that they were that they were involved in and I was involved in. So in a team, let's say there's um, not that one. Let's have a look here. Okay, so um, as we can see, there's a question here, and then there's 16 replies. So if any of these guys who are in 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 here, so so David here and Andre, if they if one of them was in here, if you can imagine I'm David and this was Andre, and then you went to the activity option, you would see that activity being listed in here. And providing you, you, you remembered what the conversation was about, you might not necessarily remember where it is, but providing you know it was with this person and it was roughly about that, then you can simply click on it and it will open up that entire conversation in the right team, in the right channel, and take you straight to it. Um, then you have your activity feed. So the activity feed, this is definitely should probably be your starting point. So when you land in Teams, your activity feed will hold a list of everything in chronological order with the latest one at the top, showing you any time you've been involved in something. So this could be somebody's um, Re replied to something you've asked or you've asked a question of them and um, somebody's liked something you've done or you've liked something they've done and then they've reacted to that it could be that somebody's called you and you've missed a call with them it could be that somebody's mentioned a channel or a team that you're in part of and you should be looking at that information rather than having to go to the teams area and you might have dozens or hundreds of teams or rather than having to go to the chat area and you might have dozens or hundreds of chats, you can simply go to your activity feed and everything that you haven't yet been made aware of that, should, that the team thinks is important to you because somebody's mentioned your name or they've done something against something you've done, everything will be listed here in chronological order. So providing you keep this information up to date, and if it's not up to date, it will be listed in bold, so you could see which ones you haven't read. Um, that means your team's environment is, is going to be running pretty clean in terms of for, for your activity as a user. Um, okay, calendar area in here. I'm not really going to show you. It's just a, it's just a small thing just to, to say that this is linked to your Outlook calendar. So you can create appointments here directly or you can create appointments directly in Outlook. The difference is if you do them here, when you add an attendee, it automatically creates a, a Teams link within this meeting. So that you don't need to do that where within Outlook, you've got to specify it's a Teams meeting to get the, the link for them to use it. 
Um, you can also, when you're in the calendar view here, use the meet now option to simply start a meeting. Now this is going to be moved shortly, so this will this will disappear from the calendar view, and it's actually going to appear in every channel. So inside of a channel, you can select, you'll be able to press meet now, and then that will just start a meeting inside of this channel where you'll use the conversation area here and the files area here as, as functionality for that meeting. Um, also, you've got the option when you're inside of Teams only to schedule things called live events, which is more like a broadcast. So similar to what we're doing now, a webinar, um, these dependent on what policies have been set for, for in your team's administration center may be allowed to be public or may not. They might only be for your business and you could specify them for, for individual people. Um, so the other thing I want to show you then was the files area here. So within the files area, you've got um, a few options. So the recent area is very useful. It will show you all files that you have recently been working on across Office 365. This is not just within Teams. So these can be files in your OneDrive. These can be files um, that have been shared to you from other people's OneDrives. They can be files from SharePoint. They can be files from, from within Teams. All in chronological order. So these this should be a list of all of the files you've recently been working on. The Microsoft Teams view is a similar thing, but it's just all of the documents from in Teams but not necessarily that you've been working on, just documents that have been updated recently from anywhere that you've got access to see. This is a little bit less useful uh, as, a, as a view. Um, they're not, you can see um, which, which team it is and which channel it is, but it's not in any particular, um, there's no sorting or filtering or anything like that. So it's very difficult to find anything in here. However, what is very useful is the fact that you have access to your own OneDrive. So without needing to leave Teams, you can come and have a look at all of your own personal files in OneDrive directly from within here. And this is something that's often missed by users. And um, they tend to either use the synced copy of OneDrive on their local machine or leave Teams and go and use the OneDrive application from the browser. You don't need to do either of those things. You can just simply work with your files directly from within the Teams environment. Um, something else you can do is you can add extra applications directly into Microsoft Teams. Now this is extremely useful. So this is the ability to come into here select more apps and add additional applications directly into a Teams environment. Some of the applications, depending on which one they are, may want to charge you money, some of them are free. The Microsoft ones are all, are all inbuilt. Um, and some of them, as we saw with Flow, is it, it adds it to the Teams environment, which means it appears as an additional option. Some of them will appear as attachments into a team or into a channel. So if I was to add um, this one here, this MindMeister, so this is a one that you use to create mind maps. Um, that one will, if, if I was to add that, um, will ask me, do I want to add that to a team or do I want to add that to a chat? And I can add it to either and then it will allow me to do a, a mind map. Um, for the one I've added here, Flow, um, I've got all of my flows that I've created, which as somebody who creates flows, so flow is um, the Power Automate. So as somebody who creates workflows within Office 365 using Power Automate, I can access and edit and create directly from within Teams without needing to leave the application. However, for most users, they probably won't be doing that. But what is really useful is I have access to my approval section. So in Power Automate, I might create uh, an approval so in the scenario i gave in the in the the presentation when a document was arriving in certain circumstances there was approvals linked to that so certain types of documents based on the compliance uh, um, and the regulations that were required for the business they needed to go straight off to a line manager get approved by somebody and then go back as yes or no and if it was no then further work needed doing etc as somebody um, working within Microsoft 365, if somebody wrote a, a, a Power Automate that said when 
X happens, send an approval off to Y and Z. As the person who is Mr. Y or Mr. Z, I can come in here and see all of the approvals waiting for me without needing to leave the application. Now I will have gotten these as emails as well. And I will, um, if I've got my Power Automate installed on my mobile device, I will get a, a notification as well and I can do it from there. But while I'm working and I use Teams, this is, this is my primary application now. I, I use Teams every day. I sit in here, I have all my communication in here. I discuss <clears throat> various topics with my team. I also then link and put in various other useful bits of extra software into the channels, etc. So I don't have to leave this application. I can access my OneDrive files. I can access all of my, my Power Automates that I'm creating, but I can also then manage all of the approvals. So as an example, somebody creates, somebody submits an expense request. That comes through to me to be approved rather than having to leave this application to go to the expenses system to do it, I can simply come in here and mark yes or no against the Power Automate. That will then go away and do the rest of whatever it's configured to do. And as I say, we can come in and add a whole host of different applications, <clears throat> some of which are very useful, um, especially in the current climate, things like bookings or shifts. So if you need to, let's say you've got a problem with um, needing to manage part-time furloughed staff. Shift is a great little tool. It allows you to simply link a shift pattern. So you, you can come in and create a schedule against a team, um, build a, a, a type. So this is for an example I was doing. So I've got warehouse and then a store, and then you add different people into your group and then you can put in these people can then use the shifts application on their device to come in and request shift swaps etc with each other and um, you can manage and monitor those requests or even make new ones yourself but that's a little extra application sitting within teams not a lot of people know and there are literally thousands of these things as i say not all of them are created by microsoft there's the majority of them aren't um, so there may be additional costs associated with some of them, but quite a lot of them are also free to use. Okay, so governance best practice considerations. Okay, so some I showed quite a bit in that Teams demonstration and I talked about some of the concepts that were, were required from governance point of view. <clears throat> I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into some of those. So within Office 365, there's a, there's a consideration um, around Office 365 groups. So when I created a, a, that UK Modern Workplace team inside of Office 365, I, I got a SharePoint site, I got a Microsoft Planner board, I got an Outlook group, all got created for me at the same time. They're all intrinsically linked together by this thing called an Office 365 group. When I then added owners and members into my team, the owners and members are then shared across that SharePoint site, the Planner, the Outlook group. This is good, but it's also a consideration that we need to take into account. Why do we need to take it into account? <clears throat> Let me give you an example. At the moment, a lot of businesses in the UK will be working, uh, have all, well, most businesses in the UK have all of their staff working from home. A lot of businesses who perhaps weren't set up to use Microsoft Teams, but are now using it, will have simply had to jump in. What that means is they'll have simply turned it on, told everybody to use it, <clears throat> And that's how they'll be. What's almost certainly happening in that scenario is they've not considered locking down the creation of Office 365 groups. They've not considered the governance that sits behind Microsoft Teams or the governance that sits behind Microsoft SharePoint or Microsoft OneDrive. How can we share with external people? What are the settings we're applying? What permissions do we need? Are they aware that 
when they created a team, they got a SharePoint site. So a good example of this would be, um, let's say you're a large company, you've got, I don't know, 50 people work in your marketing department. Somebody started using Teams and they decide, actually, we, we need a marketing team because I'm working on this um, project. My boss has assigned me a project. I've got a build, build a new uh, marketing campaign about X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to create a, a marketing team. I'll invite the, the five people from within marketing who are working with me on this, and we'll start working on that project and we'll communicate about what we're doing. We'll share the collateral that we're doing for the marketing campaign in the files area. We might even <coughs> uh, put in some extra links to so we can see the work as it's going. Maybe we're communicating with a, a third party marketing organization. So we'll, we'll invite them in as external users, as guests, and we'll put in some of their website things as extra connectors and we'll build our team and, and everything will be great. Lovely. But unbeknownst to us, um, somebody else in the marketing team who's working on another project decides, ah, I need a marketing team as well because I'm working on a different project. So they create another team called marketing. They invite five or six people who they're working with into that. There's a third one of these things happen. Now we've got three marketing teams. <clears throat> Only one of the people from the first one is invited into the third one as well. So when he opens teams, now he's looking at two marketing teams and he's wondering what's going on. He's like, hmm, I've got two marketing teams and they've got similar channels about, you know, collateral and events and, uh, and all this kind of stuff which one should I use? Should I type things into here? Should I add my conversation into there? What if I put the message in the wrong place? Should I, where should I put my files? Should I put it in this marketing team or that marketing team? So those are the kind of things that can happen in terms of without governance being in place to determine what settings should be in place, what security should be in place. A team's environment can quickly spin out of control especially in a larger organization where many people could be creating teams of a similar nature without realizing there's already one that they should have just joined. But the person who created that team didn't know to invite them. And so they now have a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth, all about the same topic, all about the same area that, quite, that could have quite easily been contained as, as one team. These are considerations that need to be taken into account. And I dare say when, when this whole lockdown is over and, and businesses start to really approach how they've implemented Microsoft Teams, there'll be a lot of work that needs to be done to undo some, some of the, the mess that businesses will have gotten themselves into. Now, one of the things that should be done is a, a full review of security in relation to security and compliance, so the labeling and sensitivity information types that I mentioned earlier, but also some of the tools within EMS, so conditional access policies should be set up. Multi-factor authentication should be enabled. Um, have these things been done currently? Maybe not, maybe they haven't been considered because a lot of people will have gone in quite quickly on, on some of those areas. These are the types of considerations that, that, that businesses will need to go through. Um, there's also team, Teams configurations. For instance, can I have external users in my team? What can guests do if I do allow them in? What can members do? So I might want to decide, actually we get audited heavily as a business and we've got the following regulatory bodies want us to provide them with information. Should I therefore be allowing my users, my members, people who work for me, to delete messages? Should I be allowing them to edit messages or should I lock that down? Should I leave that to the team owner to decide on an individual team basis or should I apply a company policy that applies that to everybody? There's also SharePoint and OneDrive sharing permissions. So OneDrive, although it's another application, OneDrive as a, as a, is really just a shrunk down version of SharePoint. So all you're seeing in, inside of OneDrive is a, a single SharePoint document library. 
the permission settings in relation to sharing are then highly tied to SharePoint. So you cannot have whatever you put into OneDrive, that's the maximum you could have had in SharePoint. So if you decided in SharePoint, I'm not going to share allow sharing with anonymous users, then you wouldn't be able to share your OneDrive with anonymous users. So you might be thinking, actually, I need my OneDrive to be able to share it with anonymous users, but that means my SharePoint system needs to be shared with anonymous users. So how do I tackle that? And these are the considerations that need to be taken into, into account and planned for thoroughly. A security model should be created in and around all of these areas. <clears throat> and staff user training should be undertaken also. There is an administration center. Let me quickly drop out of the presentation here. There's an administration center for a lot of things within Office 365, and this isn't even the things that could be connected from Microsoft Azure. As you can see, there's Power Apps, Power BI, there's a security, there's a compliance, Exchange, Power Automate, Search, Stream, OneDrive, SharePoint. So as an example with the, the OneDrive, what I was just talking about, and you can get to this same screen from within the SharePoint Admin Center. But if you look at your external sharing settings, OneDrive is linked to SharePoint. <clears throat> so if I reduce SharePoint, I reduce OneDrive. This can only ever be a maximum of whatever that is, which is something that should be considered. How do I plan? Because if I want my users to be able to share things from their OneDrive with external with with anonymous users to just be able to provide a link to access files, then my SharePoint system needs to do the same. And I almost certainly wouldn't want that for share, my SharePoint system. So there are very um, serious considerations around governance within Microsoft 365 to take place. Um, they should ideally be done before you implement Office 365. Some thought should be done around security, around sharing, around external access, conditional access, device management, mobile application management, information governance in relation to sensitive information types, content relation and um, retention, sorry, and so on. Okay, thank you for your attention. Um, that's the end of the webinar. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to post into the chat? And we can go through those. Otherwise, thank you very much.